Life Audio. The Mama Take Heart podcast with Rebrina Rettle is brought to you by Life Audio and is a part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. You're listening to Mama Take Heart, Understanding Your Gen Z Girl, a show designed to help you be the compassionate, gospel-centered, and influential voice in your girl's life. I'm your host, Rabrina Rattle. Joining us today is Kristen Tourette, blogger, speaker, and author, Kristen has a master's degree in theology and religious studies. She's been a teacher and children's ministry director at her church before deciding to write fiction and nonfiction full time. She's had three Christian contemporary romances published and her latest novel, See You Monday, a young adult novel, which we'll be discussing today, uses fictional characters to take us through real life experiences during the civil rights movement and its effects on Gen Z today. Kristen's work can also be found on Crosswalk.com, Sharing Our Stories, a blog about racial reconciliation, and Holy Love Ministries. Kristen lives in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia with her husband and two Gen Z children, a middle schooler and a high schooler. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kristen. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I am born and raised in the South. I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I live now in the suburbs of Atlanta. I have two kids, a middle schooler and a high school daughter. I'm a 17-year-old daughter, and my middle schooler is a son, by the way, but we just, we we have fun. We do a lot of sports. I grew up in a non-sports family, I would say. So that's a whole new world for me now because both of my kids are super athletes, but it's fun. So we're super busy every day, but yeah, it's enjoyable. And I write. So I always joke that like my evenings and afternoon, late afternoons are more hectic with the schools at school kid activities, but during the day is when everything's quiet and that's when I write and I'm just kind of a a computer nerd and a book nerd and I love writing. I can't believe that I get to do it as a job. I started out in children's ministry and before that even in early childhood education. So it's kind of a far stretch to what I do now, but I enjoy it. I write young adult novels now. So writing for young, mostly teens and women. So Wow. That's awesome. Well, you know, you said it's a long stretch, but you know, God equips (laughs) along the way. So everything (laughs) was an equipping to lead you here. Yes. Well, I wanted to to be a writer as a kid. I, I really was. I would write stories like little short stories and was kind of always in a, my nose was always in a book. But I think that I thought that was just not a job that I would end up being able to do. I don't know. It's kind of like I sidelined that and got into all kinds of other things. And I kind of found my way back to it somehow. Oh, that's great. Yes. Yeah. So I'm interested in the topic that you chose, your book, See You Monday, your young adult fiction book, and how you set that book up. I thought it was also very interesting. Why did you choose to write the book and why did you choose this topic? Okay. Yes. So I actually see you Monday is inspired by some stories from my mother. So she, you know, grew up she was 10 and 11 and 63 and 64 in in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so I was, you know, growing up hearing her stories of how she saw firsthand desegregation happen in her schools and how she remembers watching Dr. King give the, I have a dream speech on TV. She remembers the, the country, what it felt like the country come to a halt when Kennedy was assassinated. And, you know, she remembers her, the first black family to move into her neighborhood and how it caused a ruckus kind of in, in the community, sadly. And so all these things happened within a couple years span of time. And I was always very fascinated by it. And if you asked my mom, she would tell you that that time period of her life, and there were some other parts of the, her story in the, in, that, that did inspire See You Monday that aren't strictly related to like the civil rights movement, but she really saw God 
in action and God play out and work miracles in her life and her family's life. And, and he opened her eyes to things that she was not aware of as a child that were going on right around her. Mm -hmm. And so she kind of looks back and says, that's when, you know, I was changed forever. Like I couldn't not unsee what I saw, you know, God impacted me in such a way that I, I couldn't deny that he was real and that he was working and that there were things to be done. So I always kind of wanted to tell that story but I knew that I had to get better as a writer in order to do that. So it took me some time to finally sit down and say, okay, I'm going to give this a go. I'm going to try to write this story, but I had to find a way to make it relevant to today. And mm -hmm. all the, the, some of the same themes and struggles we're going through with today mm -hmm. and how it actually, there's a lot of mirroring happening, but how, you know, how can I speak to kids and tell them about this time period? And so that's where Grace's character comes in. Um, she's a 17 year old senior in high school. And so we're kind of seeing flashbacks into the sixties, but we're also seeing Grace's present day life happening. And she's waking up when mm. she's hearing about times from you know, what is her grandmother's life and story? She's waking up to things that she is not real realizing are around her and are going on around her. And it's starting to change the way she sees things. And, and it's all about choices and one choice can change everything. So what God, what God, what you may think is a small choice or, you know, not really any significance, God can make a big choice and make a big impact with, and you may not ever know how it impacted that person, but God does. And so it's all about choices. And so we see the, the life of the 10 and 11 year old little girl play out and the choices that she's making and her family's making. And then it, it's mirroring some of the same things that Grace is now dealing with in today's time, and the same, some, some of the same circumstances. And we're, watching their choices impacting those around them mm -hmm. for good, but it can also, they can also impact for bad, you know, so for evil. So I just think it's really important to have our eyes open. So if you ask me why I wrote the book, I think I would have to say, you know, to open eyes, honestly, I keep, I keep coming back to that because I think that we're so blinded sometimes to things that we weren't taught or the enemies blind, blinded us to. And it's my hope that by, pointing out some of the things going on in, in the, the civil rights movement as a time period and, and things going on today that, you know, the, the kids today are looking back and going, oh my goodness, that, that really happened. That played out in real life. These are our grandparents that, that witnessed this firsthand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that long ago. That's the other thing I always, I feel that sh I sh maybe should impact our kids more is that the, their grandparents the, the teenagers of today, their grandparents went through this right. and that does not feel that long ago. I'm a, I'm a generation between them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we grasp onto that and go, wow, like this is the, the effects of all of this is, are still playing out. It's impossible mm -hmm. for it to just stop after one generation. It just doesn't work that way. So, you know, we, to watch it all happen and, and make the right choices and open eyes to what's going on around us now, but to see what was going on back then. It's just, it's just so important. I agree. And I appreciate that you have this heavy uh, topic in a young adult fiction book. And I always encourage parents to read. Okay. So I'm a young adult fan. Mm -hmm. okay. So I like to read young adult fiction, but it also helps me understand what's going on in mm -hmm. their world. Because a lot of times, and I, I think I've said this before, that my daughter and I would swap books. And so sometimes she'd say, you really should read this book. And sometimes I like to read authors so I can see how they write because I'm a layer person. I love layers in a story. And uh, so I kind of like to see how the layers play out. And then other times I will give my daughter a book to read and say, you should really read this book. And sometimes the books that I give her to read are to expand her way mm -hmm. of thinking, even though it's a young adult fiction book. And so I do encourage parents to sometimes read what your daughter is reading, or sometimes choose a young adult fiction book on your own and read it. And then if you find that the message would resonate, or it's another way of expanding your daughter's way of thinking to, to pass that on. Now, sometimes the kids will give you a book to read that you don't necessarily, there may be things in it you don't agree with. 
Mm-hmm. That is an open door for conversation. That That's kind of how I look at it. I Sometimes I didn't appreciate and was, I could have even been offended by some of the things that were in the book, but that's an open door to conversation because it seemed like a norm for them, like a normal thing. And so I'm curious, what makes that normal in your world? I would say that also with uh, these types of books, to use it as a a bonding. That's what it is. Yeah. So if you read together, because I've done that before, too, if we've read a book together and because I am messy with my books. (laughs) I have like 10 beside my bed right now. (laughs) Yes. I underline. Oh, yeah, I do that, too. (laughs) My daughter cannot stand that. She's very pristine with her books. She doesn't like her. Care of them. She doesn't like the the soft covers to get bent. Like she's Mm -hmm. very particular. I am not. So she's like, yeah, I don't want to read your book. Can I get my own? (laughs) Anyway, but especially in this particular topic, because the climate is, it is, it's a sad, it's a sad time. It is. I would say. So funny that you are mentioning this because I actually am reading my book to my son right now and he's 12. So he's a middle schooler, sixth grader. And I sadly, my kids are not really readers. They take after their dad and um, they can't sit still long enough. They're good. They can read and they're good at reading, but they just don't enjoy it. So, so I, I offered to read my book to him, gosh, a month or so ago, we're kind of slowly working through it. And he, he said, yes. And I was kind of shocked because we used to read as when he was a child, but we kind of had gotten out of that habit. Mm-hmm. And so we've had the best time reading just a couple pages or a chapter here and there every night and try to do it about every night. And, you know, last night we specifically read a part in the story where the, the school is desegregating in Chattanooga. This is in 63 going up to fifth grade at that point. So it would have been kindergarten through fifth grade. And in 1963, mind you, so, you know, the federal law had been mandated a long time before it hit Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is shocking to me, which is upsetting to me. However, I had to do lots of research about how Chattanooga desegregated. But anyways, the principal in the story who happened in real life to be friends with my mom's family, he was getting death threats because mm-hmm. desegregation was set to happen the next day. And, and that obviously there was many in opposition and he, he was receiving death threats about it. And, and I got finished reading that part and it's, you know, it's painful to read and it makes you angry. And, and he, you know, had questions at the end of it. And that's why we're reading it, you know, because I want him to ask questions about it. I want to be able to talk to him about it. And he, he actually literally said, did that really happen? And I said, yes, that really happened. This is a real person. I found actual newspaper articles in my research about this particular principal and how he received death threats. Like it's, it's true. And he just, he, his mind is just boggled by this. The idea that his friends down the street would not have been able to go to school with him and that mm-hmm. someone would have seen received death threats about it. And so, but that causes the conversation and he can't be ignorant or naive anymore Right. when we have those conversations. And so though I love his reaction of just a stop, like he in shock and painful shock, he just can't believe it. We have to have those conversations because he needed, he needs to know that and understand that mm-hmm. you can talk about the word desegregation or segregation or integration or whatever in school. But until you like hear somebody and he realizes my grandmother went through that, like she saw that happen in her school. It doesn't, it's not real. It's, it doesn't make as much of an impact. And so stories, I think are some of the best ways to have conversations about Mm -hmm. race, especially with kids to get the conversation started at least. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. If you are not in a multicultural area and you do not have multicultural friendships, this is a good way to uh, find out what what is happening in other people's lives or in people of color and or what is happening with allies of people of color and how racism is affecting them. And we know that Gen Z is is the most diverse generation. And so they may know and even now the history is one thing, but they're experiencing 
still ripple effects of the history today. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to talk to them about how are you feeling about this? Mm -hmm. You know, and and that leads me to ask you the question, which you kind of talked about a little bit, but how you talk to your kids about race. As you said that you're a woman who you raised in the South or you live in, just so you know, though, racism is not just in the South. Some people think that's, no, there's all different levels Mm, and types of racial discrimination. But in particular, how do you talk to your kids about what's going on in our world today and about race in general? Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, what pops into my mind when you asked me that question and you know, the first thing is I feel like I'm really real with my kids. I, I do not sugarcoat things. I feel like I, before, maybe before I had kids, I don't know, maybe just as I was growing up, maybe, I don't know that it was kind of like, Oh, don't, don't say anything because you don't want to say the wrong thing, or you don't want to offend anybody or don't speak up and certainly be knowledgeable before you speak up and say anything. But I think that's one of the worst things we can do is just to kind of keep our mouths closed sometimes Mm -hmm. and not say anything at all. So I feel like I'm pretty, pretty upfront and honest with them about things that we see on television. Mm -hmm. And, and we talk about it really openly about, you know, if to get into specifics, you know, the Ahmaud Arbery case is a Georgia Mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. We live in North Georgia. That was in South Georgia, but his murder hit really hard. For us here. And I mean, my kids saw me crying my eyes out about this for days when it happened. Mm -hmm. And there was a hashtag going around for a while about run with mod. And, and Mm -hmm. I talked to my kids about it. Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to run and I'm going to post about it because I may not be able to prosecute those people. That's not something I can specifically do, but I can bring awareness to the situation. Mm. And so I'm going to run and I'm going to use that hashtag. Would you guys like to do that with me? And both my kids were like, yeah, let's, let's do it. But I had to explain to them why we were, we were running. I even explained to my son why, you know, the differences that he is him being a white boy running through that neighborhood probably would not have been a big deal. Mm. And, you know, he's, again, he's young, but he's still like, what? Like he kind of doesn't, understand. I I don't think he truly understands yet, but my daughter does. My daughter understands it. Mm -hmm. My daughter sees her friends feel Mm -hmm. that way and talk openly about that. But, but anyways, I just, I think I'm really open about it. They see my emotion about it. They see my anger about it. They see me watch the court cases on TV. And so that prompts conversations. I think that, you know, the other flip side of that was just being real though. I think sometimes how I discuss race with my kids is more about like the discussions we have without words, if that mm-hmm. can make sense. Like mm-hmm. maybe just setting an example mm-hmm. is I can tell them something, but unless they see me do it, they're not going to do it. Right. So, right. I, you know, I just, when I'm thinking about that question, you know, I think about them knowing that under our roof, we're always going to be accepting of anybody that walks through the door. Mm-hmm my kids have so many different types of friends, uh, you know, from different cultures and backgrounds and different skin colors and, and on our street, our neighbors that we interact with every single day are are that way, or, you know, don't, don't look like me. And, and I think that they, you know, see that and know that about me and their dad, that that doesn't matter to us. And, you know, my daughter, she's 17. We've had plenty of boyfriends and crushes at this point. You know, that's something that you definitely deal with, with a teenage girl. And I, you know, she has never been scared to, to tell me about somebody or bring home somebody that didn't look like her. Mm -hmm. So I think that just being able to let them be open and, and choose who they want friendships with and just being accepting and loving and just leading by example, I think is one of the best ways we talk about race with our kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Modeling. You, you're basically, modeling, yes. basically modeling to them how to uh, treat people and how to view people. And we are all a Mago Day created in God's image. Yeah. I will say that over and over and mm-hmm. over and over because I just truly believe that when you have that mindset, yes. it just changes the way you look at people. Uh, 100%. You know, 
we talk about that a lot, actually, too, in, in, under my roof, just how, you know, the, the gospel is for everyone, every single person. It, it doesn't matter what shade of skin you are. It doesn't matter where you were born in the world. It is for every single person. Yes. And so if you truly understand that and that and have Jesus, you, you've accepted him as your, you know, as Christ, then we are then to go model and, and share his love and example. And so how can we do that without accepting every single person mm. that crosses our path anywhere? You know, in my everyday life, that looks like their friends at school and the families that we interact with, with sports and, you know, church and things like that. But, um, but I mean, this just is for anywhere right. and it, it doesn't even just stop up, obviously with, with skin colors too. Like I think about different cultures right? because we have so many people from different areas live here in our, in our community, certainly from central and South America too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we can't just be accepting of one and not the other. I mean, this goes, this spans every single person. Yes. And so I think that as long, like you said, if, if we, if we can get our minds wrapped around the grace and the beauty of being created in God's image. Every single person is made with a purpose and a plan mm-hmm. in the image of God, mm-hmm. um, made perfect. He made every single one of us perfect, exactly how he wanted us to be. Mm-hmm. Then, I mean, we, we would have a lot better, better, um, things going on in the world. <laughs> right. You know, one thing I feel like we forget is Martin Luther King. Dr. King was a pastor first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As I was reading and researching about his life and, and of course, certainly his speech. So at the March um, on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, which, by the way, I didn't really realize was such a big deal. Like, I, I'm sure I learned that in school, but I did not understand the gravity of where and when his I have a dream speech took place. Mm. So side note, that's in the book too. But, you know, he was a pastor first. His speeches were laced with Bible verses. Like, he spoke, I think they, they estimate 400,000 people were watching that speech. I think it's up to that number now. I could be wrong. So don't definitely don't quote me on that. But if you imagine pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King speaking over that many people and speaking words in, interlaced with Bible verses, mm-hmm. he is literally pouring out the spirit over that many people when he's talking. Mm -hmm. And I just, it's like mind, mind blowing, but we forget that he brought Jesus into all that he said, even if he didn't say his word, all the, his name all the time, that's what he was doing, you know? And, and even then, even at the March, if you look at the program of who, who spoke, you know, the gospel, the, the most famous gospel singer at the time saying like right before him or something, or right before a couple before him, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Elia Jackson. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Jack. I knew her last name was Jackson. I couldn't remember her first name. And I'm just like, we, for we, as you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old this year. I'm actually 40 now. And my, I have high, you know, teenage kids and, you know, I, I should know these things, but I do not, I did not realize I, it, it's kind of, it, it almost like it's something we don't talk about as, as much as we should, that God was brought into that movement, mm-hmm. you know, because of people like Dr. King and, and Miss Jackson. And, and we've kind of taken them out mm. now, you know, I feel like we've kind of taken them out because we don't want to ever offend anybody, but that's, what's going to impact the world is, is Jesus. In my community, we pass down stories. And so we know those stories and we've heard those okay. stories. And so for us, it's a, it's a history that you don't necessarily see in the history books or yes. read the history books, but we know the history. Mm. And so that is one of the things that is uh, very important. I appreciate you bringing that up. That yes, he, Reverend Dr. Yes, Martin Luther King. Thank Martin you. Luther yes. King. yes. And, and I'm glad that you even mentioned that you, the stories. So that brings up another point is if we're going to impact, you know, Gen Z and have good race relations and and conversations, you know, we have to be good listeners. Mm. Like I want to hear your stories also. And, you know, I think that is something that we think we know everything. We all, you know, we're grown up, we have internet access. We believe everything we see, you know, all those kinds of things, but we're not good listeners anymore. 
And I feel like I want to hear your stories because those are stories that I did not hear. And I would want to learn from them Mm -hmm. and, and not be naive and not be ignorant to things that I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really good. And one thing I can also say is just to, you know, be a good listener. If we could teach our kids, the the generation coming up behind us to be good listeners and to invest time in listening to other people that, you know, that could really make a difference in in the world. I think. (laughs) I agree. Well said. (laughs) Well, so I could not agree with you more. Okay, I know you're working on another book. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Okay, so my other book is another time slip novel, meaning that it goes back in time. We have flashbacks um, and we get to see a lot of generations play out in the story. Mm -hmm. And it's focused on a girl named Mia. She's a 17 year old um, girl about to be a senior in high school. And she is biracial and she has never met her extended family, but beyond a great aunt and her parents before they left town before she was born. And she they've never been back. So her father passes away right before the book begins. And basically she's kind of thrown back into her parents' hometown for the first time meeting all of her grandparents. And she recognizes pretty quickly, but then is told that there, there is a big feud going on between them. The whole town knows about it. They they've heard it has something to do with murder, but they don't know exactly why and what's going on. They they, all, everyone knows bits and pieces Mm -hmm. of the story, but kind of crazy thing is, is that they are neighbors. And so that is where, so Mia is caught between both sides, both grandparents, uh, one black, one white, and she's, sets out to figure out what's caused this feud. Mm. And that sends us back, you know, in time to the Great Depression. And this was a lot of fun research about sharecropping in Mississippi and how landowners with the New Deal you know, with Roosevelt got land as farming co-ops and how that later ended up being the same landowners that were able to use their land as collateral in the Freedom Summer movement Mm. and get people out of jail that were protesting um, nonviolently, protesting Mm. and trying to register Black voters. Mm. So it's just, it's a great story. There's a a lot of intricacies in history that I absolutely never knew about. We also have World War II happening in the story. We, you know, we flash back to the generation, this generation on both sides from World War II and, um, but it's just, it's, it's another great story that flashes back to a part of the civil rights movement with Freedom Summer in Mississippi is what it is. And so very interesting, lots of stuff I never knew that I'm excited to share with people. Well, that does sound interesting. And then, you know what I noticed about what you just talked about in your new book coming, Freedom Summer? Uh, fences, fences Left Broken, yes. Okay. <laughs> and then in See You Monday is, in the back of the book, you have all your research, Mm -hmm. where you got your research from and the website Mm -hmm. links. I thought that was brilliant because I am that person too. I like to do my research myself and I like to kind of dig deeper. And so I thought that was really good. Like if you want more information, this is where you go. Because, you know, when we were talking about how do you talk to your kids about race, some people don't necessarily know the history Yes. They know some things happen, but they don't know the true, mm-hmm. deep down history of how we got where we are today. And so it's yes. good to do that on your own. Yes. And then it really awakens you to like, wow, I had no idea. So it's, many things that were not taught in school. Y- yes. So much. So I am. I, I am just encouraged that you do that. You put all that information there so that if a person wants to dig deeper, they can uh, dig deeper on their own and research. And then especially uh, if they're tweens and teens, you know, it gives them something to look at. And who knows, maybe someone can use your book to help them write a paper. You never know. Hey, maybe. Well, (laughs) FYI to anybody listening, all those links are on my website too. So they're listed in the back of the book, but if you actually want to go to to the live link, they are on my website. And yes, I love history. So it was fun to research. I would actually say I was going to write a chapter, you know, about this one day. And I would spend two days like actually researching before I even wrote the thing, because I would get so down the rabbit hole of research in the same way. It's fascinating. And, but yeah, so I'm really excited about, about the book. Hopefully um, it will be in reader's hands one day. (laughs) 
<laughs> one day soon. What do you yeah, think? Twenty twenty three, maybe. Yeah, probably twenty twenty three at this point. I don't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the if publishing world is out, slow. <laughs> if I'm still hanging out. We'll have you back on. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so well, you mentioned your website. So, how else can our listeners connect with you? So yeah, I have a, a website, kristentourette.com and also on Facebook and Instagram, you can, you know, search Kristen Tourette on either of those. I think I would pull up pretty quickly. I have an author page on Facebook and my Instagram is kind of my author page, but also lots of, you know, personal fun stuff that I throw out there too. But, but yeah, I'd love to connect with everybody. Remember God is for you and you're not alone with his spirit. You are filled with courage and strength of purpose. So don't fret mama. Instead, Take Heart. Mama Take Heart is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. If you liked what you just listened to, would you take a second and leave us a rating in your favorite podcast app? It really does help more people like you find our show. This podcast is produced by me, Kelly Givens, and Stephen Sanders, with executive oversight by Stephen McGarvey. You can find more podcasts like this over at lifeaudio.com. Thank you.